Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Dr. Aaron Bernstein received his medical degree from the University of Chicago's Pritzker School of Medicine. He completed a combined residency in pediatrics at Harvard Medical School and the Boston University School of Medicine. Today, Dr. Bernstein is on the faculty of the Harvard Medical School and the Center of Health and Global Environment. In 2009, he became the course director for Human Health and Global Environment uh, Change, offered jointly at the Harvard School of Public Health and Harvard Medical School. This is the only such course offered at the medical school, school in the United States. Dr. Bernstein is also on the staff of Children's Hospital in Boston. His awards include a 2008 Harvard University Zuckerman Fellowship and Stanford University's Firestone Medical, uh, Medal for Research. Dr. Bernstein's work examines the human health dimensions of global environmental change, such as climate change and biodiversity loss, with the aim of promoting a deeper understanding of these subjects among policymakers, educators, and the public. He's the lead author and co-editor of Sustaining Life, how Human Health Depends on Biodiversity, the most comprehensive and accessible account available of the ties between human health and the natural world. This book has been widely acclaimed and was named one of the best biology books in 2008 by Library Journal. Tonight, Dr. Bernstein will explain for us the delicate relationship between human health and biodiversity in nature. That relationship may not seem obvious, but on Earth, life on Earth rather does in fact depend on biological variety for reasons that will be made clear tonight by this most distinguished researcher. It is a very great honor to welcome our distinguished guest, Dr. Aaron Bernstein. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> to be with you. Um, I uh, am particularly delighted to have the opportunity to uh, be a part of this series um, from Science for the Public. Um, the topic, as Yvonne mentioned, will be how human health depends on biodiversity. Um, but I want to start with a story, and it's a story that um, comes from my years as a resident. And when I was working as a resident, um, I had a clinic where I saw children. And one day, uh, I saw a young girl, we'll call her Sarah, uh, who came into my office eating an apple. And as a pediatrician, I learned very early on that there are probably few better things to do than compliment uh, a mother uh, when you have the chance. And so I saw this opportunity as a great chance to do that because usually parents bribe their children when they come to the pediatricians by saying, you know, if you behave well, we'll take you for ice cream or a hamburger or something like this. Um, but I was more curious uh, and uh, asked Sarah where she got the apple from. And she responded, well, I got the apple from the supermarket. And I said, well, but where do you think that apple's really from? And Sarah looked at me sort of quizzically and said, no, I got it at the supermarket off the shelf. And I said, no, no, but before the supermarket, where do you think the apple came from? And at this point, Sarah's mom's face took on a sort of awkward uh, look. And uh, Sarah was just completely puzzled. And it became clear that Sarah really didn't understand that the apples in the supermarket, in fact, at one point, grew on trees. Um, and this was rather horrifying to Sarah's mom, as you might imagine. Now, uh, the reason I tell this story is because um, the horror that Sarah's mom experienced is essentially a reflection of what I believe rests at the heart of the global environmental problems, uh, some of which I will talk about in my remarks. And that is that through no fault of our own, many humans, many of us, have learned that we are somehow separate from nature, as if 
we could transform the planet, change the composition of its atmosphere, uh, harness its resources in unsustainable ways, um, and as I will talk about this evening, uh, remarkably reduce the variety of life on Earth, as if this would have no effect on ourselves. And although it might be nice to believe that, the reality is, is that the health of uh, our own health is really inseparable from the health of other species. Now, the term biodiversity, which is uh, the substance of what I'm going to talk about tonight, is not a term that generally conjures up uh, lots of images in people's minds. Um, most people tend to think of big bright birds or large cats and other uh, species that I would generally call the charismatic megafauna. Uh, but the reality is very few people uh, think of these. Um, but if you were a gambler, you probably would because uh, these are beetles. And uh, I just want to share with you an anecdote about beetles. So there was a famous uh, biologist, an eminent biologist named J.B.S. Haldane. And uh, although there's a lot of controversy about the quote I'm going to share with you from Haldane, and there's been a lot written about it, suffice to say, um, when asked uh, what one could conclude about the, what the creator had in mind when he created life on Earth, Haldane is reputed to have replied he had an inordinate fondness for beetles. Uh, and with good reason. There are about 350,000 described beetle species. That's about 40% of all known insects, and a number that's six times greater than all the vertebrate species that have been identified. Uh, what you are looking at uh, on the screen is a page from a folio uh, prepared during an expedition of British scientists to uh, Mexico and Central America in the late 19th century, and it depicts 30 species of beetles that were uh, described on that trip. We only know about two million species well enough to have given them a scientific name, and most of those only from a single encounter in the wild. Uh, but the number of species on Earth may in fact be 10 million species, uh, if not more. Uh, it turns out that while we generally think about biodiversity or talk about biodiversity in terms of species richness or the number of species, species are but one part of what biodiversity is. When we when you think about biodiversity, it's important to think about it at three levels. Um, there's genetic diversity, and the simplest way to, to relate that concept is uh, with dogs. So lots of people own dogs. Mm, domesticated dogs are all the same species, and yet the difference between a Rottweiler and a Pulo seems enormous. And yet the difference between the two is not a difference of species. It's really just a genetic difference. And I'm going to talk more about that uh, in a bit. Species, diversity of species is obviously a form of biodiversity, as well as ecosystems. The diversity of ecosystems is a unique component of biodiversity. Uh, the reason why it's important to think about biodiversity in three levels, particularly in the context of human health, is because each level has relevance uh, to uh, human well-being. So this topic uh, of biodiversity and human health uh, touches upon all the basic determinants of what keeps us healthy. It touches upon foods, medicines, the understanding of how our bodies work in health and disease, and many more. And to make the case to you uh, that our health depends upon the health of nature, I'm going to focus in on one aspect of this interface, and that's infectious diseases. And so I'm going to use that as a lens with which to really try and make concrete that, in fact, we uh, remain very much a part of the tapestry of life, and that if we uh, damage the tapestry, uh, the, the very tapestry in which our species evolved in, there's a tremendous amount at stake for ourselves. So with that by way of overview, let's uh, get to the heart of the matter and uh, talk about infectious diseases. So this is a picture, uh, which some of you may be familiar with, of Alexander Fleming holding up his famous Petri dish, which cultivated uh, the original uh, widely used antibiotic, which is penicillin. Uh, penicillin, of course, comes from a mold, the Penicillium notatum mold. And what's interesting is that Fleming, although he gets most of the credit for discovering this mold, uh, turns out was not the first person to really describe the ability of molds to inhibit the growth of bacteria. In fact, there are reports from centuries before in various parts of the world of people observing the same thing. But I guess Fleming was in the right place at the right time. 
Now what's interesting is that it was only a few years after Fleming discovered penicillin that resistance to penicillin first appeared. So this is a timeline of antibiotic discovery on the top and the appearance of resistance to those antibiotics at the bottom. And you can see that here's penicillin, uh, which really came into widespread use uh, in the early 1940s. And by 1947, resistance had already been discovered. And what this timeline really illustrates is what has been a cat and mouse game over the last 70 or so years in uh, trying to keep up with resistance developing in bacteria that cause disease. Now, uh, the bacteria that uh, was first observed to be resistant to penicillin is a bacteria called Staphylococcus aureus, which I'll talk about in a moment, but there have been lots of different bacteria and other pathogens like malaria that have been affected by this phenomenon of antibiotic resistance. So one of them is tuberculosis. Uh, right now, one in three human beings are infected with the bacteria that causes tuberculosis. And what this map shows you uh, are the percentages of patients throughout the world that have either multi-drug resistant TB, represented here by MDR, or uh, within these pie charts, uh, the smaller percentages that are so-called XDR, or extensive drug resistant TB. Now tuberculosis is, a very, uh, is caused by a very slow growing bacteria, and it's hard to treat without drug resistance. But extensive drug resistant uh, tuberculosis has proven to be an incredibly difficult challenge to treat. And with the prevalence of the disease, this form of resistance poses a major uh, challenge to human health. Uh, this picture is of what, uh, what's known as a bacterial plasmid. Um, it's just a circle of DNA. And what's interesting about plasmids is that they are circles of DNA that are easily swapped from one bacteria to another. Now, this isn't just any old circle of DNA. This circle of DNA, this plasmid, uh, is known as NDM which uh, is short for New Delhi metalloproteinase, and it confers resistance to some of the most powerful antibiotics we have. It was first discovered in a bacteria known as Klebsiella in a, a man in India, actually in New Delhi, uh, who had a urinary tract infection. And it conferred such resistance to this bacteria Klebsiella that the uh, first individual who was found to have this resistance plasmid died from the disease. Uh, the plasmid has now been seen in all these bacteria pictured on this slide, Klebsiella, E. coli, cholera, and others. And some of these bacteria cause very common disease. So E. coli is the most common cause of urinary tract infections. Uh, we, uh, many of you will have heard of cholera, which is a disease transmitted uh, uh, in water. Um, it has affected Haiti after, uh, after the earthquake. But suffice to say, this is a very new phenomenon. Uh, this plasmid was discovered uh, a little over a year ago now. And so uh, the, pace of and, uh, the pace and extent of antibiotic resistance uh, is, is uh, rather fast and arguably accelerating. Now I want to delve into this issue of uh, the methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, or MRSA, a bit more, because this is a bacteria that most people in the United States will have either heard of uh, because someone they know have had it or they'll have had personal experience with it. Um, the, m uh, the bacteria Staph aureus uh, is actually a normal inhabitant of many of us, so it lives on and in us uh, without causing disease. Um, it uh, can cause infections in bones and joints. It can cause pneumonia. Uh, if you were to go to an emergency room uh, in Boston and look at the infections caused by Staphylococcus aureus, about five percent to 25 percent would be considered resistant, uh, methicillin resistant. So the prevalence is uh, relatively high. In other parts of the country, that prevalence is much higher. Uh, the most common form of infection that this bacteria causes is a skin infection or cellulitis, as is pictured here. Um, but what's interesting about the history of this bacteria, the Staphylococcus aureus, is uh, just as was pictured in the initial timeline. Uh, there's been an evolution of resistance to various antibiotics. Here's the first use of penicillin. Uh, and the emergence of PRSA here is the emergence of penicillin resistance in Staph aureus. So it was only just a couple of years after the introduction of antibiotics. And what's interesting is that uh, in the early 1960s, there's the emergence of methicillin resistance Staph aureus or MRSA. So MRSA has been around for quite some time. Today, we are now seeing uh, new strains of Staph aureus that are not only resistant to the first 
generation, the penicillins, and the second generation, the methicillin. But uh, a, new a newer antibiotic called vancomycin, which to date has been a really mainstay drug for treating these diseases. Um, there are more people who die of MRSA infections in the United States every year than HIV and influenza combined. Um, so this is a major public health problem in and of itself. Uh, although there are wildly varying estimates, uh, several billion dollars are spent in the United States every year dealing with the problem of antibiotic resistance already. So why is antibiotic resistance a problem related to biodiversity? Well, really what antibiotic resistance is, is a problem related to selection. And in this diagram, uh, what you're seeing is a population of bacteria. They get treated with an antibiotic, and in any population of bacteria, you're likely to find a range of resistance to antibiotics. But of course, the only bacteria that would die when exposed to an antibiotic are the ones who are sensitive. And after that happens, you're left with resistant bacteria. So really what this is is a reduction in the genetic diversity in bacterial populations in this case. And what we've been doing with our antibiotics is essentially whittling down the diversity of uh, bacterial strains such that we get uh, widespread antibiotic resistance. Now, it had been thought for a long time that the main driver behind the development of antibiotic uh, resistance, particularly with something like MRSA, was the overuse of antibiotics in hospitals. And without question, the overuse of antibiotics in humans has driven a significant amount of the resistance that I've talked about. But it's becoming increasingly apparent that antibiotic resistance in livestock is uh, a problem. Um, there was a survey done in 2009 of pig farms in the Midwest uh, that housed about 87,000 pigs. These were very large pig farms. They surveyed about 300 of those pigs, and pigs like humans can be colonized with this bacteria Staph aureus. Almost 50%, 49% of the bacteria, of the pigs that were colonized with this bacteria uh, had MRSA. And that's because we're giving antibiotics to livestock. And in many cases, antibiotics that are very similar, if not the same, as the ones used in humans. And we are now seeing the transmission of MRSA strains cultivated in pigs into humans. Now, uh, what's interesting is that uh, we don't really know how much antibiotics are given to livestock in the United States. Um, we do know that it is significantly more uh, than is used in humans. But the real question is, what's driving this uh, appearance and high prevalence of methicillin resistance in livestock. Well, aside from the use of antibiotics, there are other things contributing. So this is a map of where pigs were produced around the world in 1922, and you'll see that there's a concentration uh, in Southeast Asia and Northern Europe and the United States. And the global production in 1922 is about 244 million pigs. Uh, let's fast forward to 2005, where global production uh, was about 925 million pigs. And what's interesting is that the areas of production are largely the same. They're certainly not uh, much greater in geographic range. They may be, in fact, a little smaller in geographic range. But today, there are about one, there's about one pig for every eight people on Earth. And the question is how you attain such a high productivity when you haven't, in fact, started raising pigs on every square foot of the Earth's land surface? And the answer is, is that our pig farms are becoming ever more concentrated. So what this graph illustrates is uh, the transition in the United States from uh, relatively small uh, regional pig farms, uh, which were present up until the early 1990s, where the average number of pigs per farm was 945, uh, to 2004, where the number of pig farms has dropped from 240,000 to 70,000, but the number of pigs per farm is 4,646. And when you crowd organisms, uh, pigs or humans, they're much more likely to transmit an infection from one to the next. And so by intensifying our agricultural and livestock productions, we're actually increasing the risk of transmission of spread. But there are other ways uh, that pertain to biodiversity uh, that are important to consider with this issue of antibiotic resistance. And one very interesting new frontier is what's known as the human microbiome. 
Now the microbiome refers to the constellation of microbes that live on and in every human being. In fact, there are probably about ten, uh, tenfold greater number of microbial cells uh, on and in every human than there are human cells. And uh, for a very long time, uh, it was taught in medical schools, as I was taught, that these, uh, you know, billions of microbes were essentially innocent bystanders uh, on our bodies and that they really didn't have much influence upon our health at all. But that understanding has been revolutionized in recent years so that we now believe that our microbiome has significant influence on a variety of disease states including the development of allergies and asthma, autoimmune diseases, and even obesity. And in recent research it's become apparent that in fact the micro the microbes that inhabit our intestines can be reservoirs for antibiotic resistance uh, even after uh, antibiotics are given to treat an infection. So given that we have uh, ample evidence from history that uh, use of antibiotics in a paradigm in which we use one antibiotic to treat one infection has a very clear pattern established of introduction of antibiotic followed by resistance. And that there's a tremendous amount at stake for public health given the burden I've talked about related to resistant organisms. I think it's about high time that we started smarting up in our use of antibiotics that we already have, but also start thinking about new ways we might better manage infectious pathogens. How and where should this new approach begin? Um, in my view, we need to start thinking about antibiotic resistance more as a matter of prudent management of biodiversity and less as a problem of a single drug versus a single bug. This is an illustration of eight of the major classes of antibiotics that I uh, use regularly in my practice as a pediatrician. And the question I would pose is of these eight classes, which are of extremely useful in our treatment of bacterial disease, which ones would exist uh, if it were not for the involvement of nature? Which is to say, which one of these groups of antibiotics would he have if nature hadn't given us either the entire drug or really the precursor to it? And the answer is none. And what's remarkable about the story of uh, antimicrobial resistance and the use of antibiotics is that we have essentially appropriated nature's weapons for treating bacterial disease in, in addition to other diseases uh, for our own use and that we have really used the uh, evolutionary war that has occurred between various bacteria and viruses and uh, other pathogens to our own advantage and harness them. But we have not employed them in the same way that nature does. In fact, when nature, uh, the paradigm that nature oftentimes uses when it deals with infections and pathogens is usually a, a multiple drug approach so that rarely would a bacteria really try and deal with another bacteria that was competing for resources by using a single antibiotic, it would use multiple antibiotics. Now I'm not advocating that we start prescribing multiple antibiotics for the treatment of infections, although in fact that's what we are being forced to do in some cases of extreme drug resistance. But it does suggest that we need to rethink the models and ways in which we deal with bacterial infections. So that's my first example of the interface between biodiversity and health. In this case, we learned not only that diversity of bacterial species in the example I gave have great relevance to this issue of antibiotic resistance, but that the diversity of the human body, this microbiome, um, has implications for the persistence of resistance. Uh, in uh, human infections. Um, I want to turn now to some examples of what I would consider the ecology of infectious disease. And uh, the question I pose to you is that when you get an infection with, in this case, a bacteria, that's what's pictured here, where does it come from? Is it that it comes from another person? or is it that it comes from another species? Most people believe that when they get sick, it's probably because somebody sneezed on them. And I would argue in most cases that's true, that in fact uh, the direct transmission of infections is usually from another human being. But if you really ask 
what percentage of human infectious diseases have life cycles that include species other than our own, the answer is quite different. So what this pie graph shows you are the percentage of infectious diseases that are so-called zoonotic, meaning that they have life cycles that involve species other than humans, and non-zoonotic. And what's clear from this is of about 1,400 diseases known to infect humans, about 60%, in fact, infect other species as well. And what's more interesting is that among so-called emerging infectious diseases, now these are diseases like MRSA or the uh, uh, NDM plasmid resistance, so uh, new diseases, um, H1N1 influenza would be another one, or old diseases that are rapidly expanding in range, uh, tuberculosis might be uh, one, or dengue fever. So if you look at these groups of infections, the ones that tend to make the news, the percentage of zoonotic diseases is even higher. So 75% of these so-called emerging infections have life cycles that include other species. If you look over time, starting from 1940 to uh, the present, and you try and categorize the emerging infectious diseases that have occurred, you'll notice a couple of things. One is that um, the majority of the infectious diseases uh, that are emerging are zoonotic from wildlife as opposed to zoonotic from non-wildlife, which would be a disease that moved from a domesticated animal, like a pig or a cow, into humans, versus wildlife, which would just be something ranging around. Uh, this hump in uh, the 80s of non-zoonotic infectious uh, diseases, emerging infections, represents uh, the effects of the origins of the HIV pandemic. There was a tremendous amount of drug-resistant organisms that became a part of it, and that's what that uh, spike represents. But you'll see overall, it's the white bars here that represent the biggest amount of the pie. The other important thing to notice here is that overall there's an increasing trend over time. So that the number of emerging infections has in fact been increasing. Now, I wouldn't consider this an accident in a world in which the amount of biological diversity uh, is changing dramatically. Uh, and that, as I mentioned at the outset, we cannot expect that changing the tapestry of life is not going to affect our own species, especially when it's clear that so many of the uh, pathogens that may affect other species can infect us as well. Um, let me give you a few examples. So this is a vulture uh, called Gyps bengalensis. And, and vultures, uh, this, this vulture uh, lives in Southeast Asia. And in, in Southeast Asia in the early 1990s, there were tens of millions of vultures. Uh, these are the three primary species, and red is bengalensis. But they're extremely prevalent. And for those of you who know a little bit about ecology, you know that uh, vultures serve a very important uh, function in ecosystems. They, they clean up uh, what's left over. They're carrion eaters. They it, eat the leftovers of, of dead animals. And so they're very important in managing the amount of food available in ecosystems. In the 1990s, vultures started dying off in droves in Southeast Asia, and it was not uncommon to see images like this, where dozens of vultures would be dead, uh, found dead, uh, from unclear causes. And the rates of loss were quite striking. So this is a, a publication that uh, looked into uh, the prevalence of vultures in various parts of India in 1991 to 93 in green and in uh, red in 2000. And you'll notice that the numbers uh, across various parts of uh, India dropped dramatically by more than 90% in all cases. And uh, in various geographic regions, so uh, the northwest, east of India, and in different species. Uh, when this research was uh, initially presented, people said, well, these researchers were looking at roadside counts of the decline of vultures, and perhaps because of development, that's why the vultures were dying. So the same researchers went back and looked in protected areas, and the data was exactly the same. So the question became, what exactly is driving this? And when you see such mass die-offs of species, uh, biologists oftentimes think that infectious disease is uh, the culprit because very few things can cause this amount of mortality. But in this case, it was not an infectious disease. It was, in fact, a medicine that was poisoning the vultures called diclofenac. Now, diclofenac is in the same family of medicines as ibuprofen. It's an NSAID. And it had been given to so-called downer cattle in India uh, to make them able to walk to market. And as these uh, cattle died, 
the vultures would eat their carcasses. And while diclofenac works as a pain reliever in cattle and in humans, in all species, diclofenac, like ibuprofen, can be harmful to the kidneys. But it was particularly toxic to the kidneys of the vultures. And so, in fact, this mass die-off of the vultures was not related to an infection, but due to the exposure to this medicine prescribed by veterinarians. So as the vultures disappeared, they left a huge void in the ecosystems of India. Uh, the best estimates are that vulture populations fell by perhaps as many as uh, uh, 30 million between the early 90s and 2003. Um, and in their place, dog populations boomed. So the government of India estimates that perhaps the, uh, that the dog population increased by as many as 5 million dogs during this period. Now, feral dogs carry a number of diseases, or can carry a number of diseases, that are transmissible to humans, including leptospirosis, brucellosis, and others. But in India, the disease of most concern, which is afflicting the dog pictured here, is rabies. There are about 55,000 cases of rabies every year in the world, and rabies carries a near 100% mortality rate. About a third of those cases occur in India. And what was found to happen in India was that as the vulture populations declined and the dog populations increased, more humans were getting bitten by these dogs. And there was an estimated increase of perhaps uh, 47,000 additional deaths during the period of the vulture die-offs between the early 90s and 2005 or so related to this ecological change that really had begun with the prescription of uh, painkiller to cattle. And so what I think this example illustrates quite clearly is that uh, we humans are very much a part of the web of life. And part of that web of life is, in fact, pathogens. And that if we cause great losses of species like vultures, it is oftentimes difficult to predict how the changes in ecology may come back and affect us. And so it is important to uh, think about the paradigm that we approach infectious diseases these days because we are transforming the planet at such a scale as to cause about uh, losses, in this case of vultures, of over 90 percent. And when you disrupt ecosystems in such a way, the presumption that that's not going to affect us, as is illustrated here, is clearly not true. I want to give a second example that points to how uh, ecology matters to the spread of infectious diseases to humans, and that's one that's quite relevant to people living here in New England, and that's Lyme disease. Now, Lyme disease is caused by a bacteria, and in order for humans to uh, catch the disease, they have to be bitten by a black-legged tick, which is pictured here. Uh, a certain percentage of patients who do get infected with Lyme disease will, will show this classic, what's called bullseye rash, um, although not all do. What's interesting uh, about Lyme disease and its transmission to humans is that the likelihood that a tick itself will get infected with the bacteria so that it can be transmitted to a human depends upon the diversity of species that live in the forest. Let me explain. This is the life cycle of uh, the black-legged tick. Uh, in its first year of life, eggs are laid in the spring and they hatch into larvae. And larvae take an initial blood meal among pretty much anything that moves. They will bite and take blood from rodents, uh, raccoons, wolves, birds, uh, even lizards. And uh, it turns out that uh, if one of these species, one of these uh, pictured up here, uh, has the bacteria that causes Lyme disease, um, the chances that a tick that bites it get infected are not equivalent. So if a tick bites, a raccoon, the odds of it getting infected are much different than if it bites this guy, the white-footed mouse. It turns out that of all the species that have been studied, the white-footed mouse is perhaps the best at transmitting an infection to the tick. Uh, after the larvae get their first blood meal, they uh, overwinter, and then they grow up to be nymphs. And it's usually at the nymphal stage in uh, late, uh, late uh, summer, or mid to late summer, where uh, nymphs bite uh, humans and can infect them with Lyme disease. Now it turns out that most species are like humans when they get bit by an infected tick, that they're so-called dead end hosts, meaning that if we get bitten by a tick and get infected, 
it's very unlikely that if a tick that wasn't infected bit us, it would get infected. So we really are, uh, we're, we're, we're an end to the infectious cycle. So I want you to envision a forest that supports a diversity of species in which the ticks, which bite almost anything, can bite any one of these creatures. So if you have a forest that has a diversity of species, you wind up with a tick population in, in which only a few of the ticks, pictured here in red, actually get infected with the disease. Remember, the ticks aren't born with the infection. They have to bite an animal to get infected. So if you have a relatively low burden of bacteria within the tick population, the likelihood that a human gets infected is relatively low. But now let's change the forest. And suppose we have a forest that supports relatively few species, and in particular supports rodent species. And what's interesting is that if you degrade a forest ecosystem and simplify it, meaning you get rid of specific habitats or specific food resources, so that you need a species that can sort of be resilient to uh, or, or, or can be highly adaptable to lots of different environments, heats, foods, and so forth, you tend to wind up species that reproduce relatively often in large numbers, like rodents. Um, and it turns out that in the case of Lyme disease, the best reservoir for the bacteria in terms of its ability to transmit an infection from itself to a tick is the white-footed mouse. And it turns out that our forests in New England, having been transformed from uh, native forests to farmland and now into new growth forests, the ecological niches have been made to favor the prevalence of these mice. So in this ecosystem, you no longer get four ticks, you get lots of ticks that become infected because the odds of the ticks in, uh, biting uh, a white-footed mouse are much higher and therefore the risk to human beings is still greater. So just to review here, in an ecosystem with a diverse population of species, uh, you see that the risk of getting an infected tick is relatively low. But in a simplified ecosystem, the number of ticks that get infected uh, is in fact much greater. And this is a phenomenon that has been called the dilution effect. Uh, and this is a term coined by uh, Rick Osfeld of the Center of Ecosystem Studies uh, in New York. And it turns out that the dilution effect doesn't just apply to Lyme disease, it applies to other infectious diseases as well, including some that you may be familiar with, like West Nile virus. But the message that the Lyme disease example tells us is that for so-called vector-borne diseases, diseases that require the transmission of a disease from one animal to another, in this case from many different uh, reservoir species in humans, there's the potential of diversity to buffer the likelihood of that infection being transmitted from a reservoir in to humans. Uh, just to show you what's happened to New England forests, there's this illustration. So uh, this is a, a, a map of the eastern United States in 1850, 1920, showing the percentage of old growth forests. So even by 1850, you can see where we are in Massachusetts, most of the forest had already been cleared for the production of food. And by 1920, pretty much all of the eastern United States had had the same. And then uh, the, the uh, other side of that coin is that the forest habitats that had been disturbed, uh, although not uh, nearly uh, pristine in 1850, were much more disturbed by 1920. And again, it's this transition in the forest ecosystem that may establish a group of species that are particularly conducive to transmitting Lyme disease. Now, the present is an interesting time when it comes to biodiversity because uh, we are living through one of the great periods of simplification in the biosphere, and the biosphere refers to all the living creatures on Earth. If you look at the rate at which species are going extinct, and again, I'm using species here not because they're the best measure of biodiversity, but because they're the one that we understand best. Um, in the fossil record, if you use the fossil record as a baseline for species extinction, the recent past, extinctions have been about 100 times that rate. So before humans existed, uh, there were about 100-fold fewer extinctions uh, than there are today. Predictions for the future are a bit more uh, dire, I'm afraid, in the sense that it's expected that the rate of biodiversity loss is going to accelerate. And the reason for that is largely due to climate change. 
Right now, the greatest driver of species loss is habitat loss. So if we chop down a forest or drain a wetland or otherwise modify a species home and it has nowhere to live, uh, that species no longer survives. And this is particularly true in uh, places of the world where there's an extreme amount of diversity, such as coral reefs or rainforests. But climate change is likely going to lead to an even higher percentage of extinctions because it affects virtually every living thing. All organisms have temperature sensitivity, and as the planet warms, species will be forced to adapt to the changes in climate. Uh, for some species that are highly mobile, like birds, they can move towards the poles to stay out of the heat. But for other species, such as trees, it may be harder to do so. Other species, like coral reefs, are particularly sensitive to the temperature of the water. And if you increase the temperature of the ocean, on average, by one degree Celsius over the period of several months, coral reefs bleach, which is a phenomenon that refers to the loss of symbiotic algae that help the coral reefs survive. And coral reefs are not so capable of getting out of the heat. In addition to the warming produced by climate change, there's also the problem of the absorption of carbon dioxide into the world's oceans. And as you absorb, as water absorbs carbon dioxide, uh, it becomes more acidic. And as the oceans of the planet are becoming more acidic, uh, which we have already shown under the release, uh, due to the release of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, this acidity uh, can dissolve the backbones of various creatures, including coral reefs, which have calcium carbonate skeletons. This is also an issue for uh, microscopic creatures known as phytoplankton, the, the microscopic plants of the ocean, which serve uh, the fundamental function of providing oxygen into the atmosphere. So climate change poses tremendous risks to biodiversity and is likely going to overtake habitat loss as the leading driver of biodiversity loss. Uh, just to put this uh, current situation into context, uh, there have been five past extinction events in Earth's history as documented here by red arrows. Uh, the most recent of which uh, is here, the late Cretaceous, in which about 50% of all uh, known genera at the time were lost. Remember, genera is the slightly higher categorization of uh, life on Earth than species, so uh, every organism has a genus name and a species name, so we're Homo sapiens, our genus is Homo, our species is sapien. So this is 50% of genera were lost at the time. And based upon our best available predictions, uh, it's likely that during the present, uh, we may in fact put at risk 50% of all species alive today. Uh, and so really this is a tremendous transformation uh, that we are living through in the tapestry of life. So the question is, what do we do about it? Uh, and I won't sit in front of you and pretend to have all the answers, but I think it's pretty clear that one thing that needs to happen is we need to figure out how we can get ourselves to recognize that in fact we remain, as we always have been, a part of the tapestry of life in which our species evolved and which we will always remain. I think through some of the examples I presented here and through many others I didn't have the time to present, uh, we can provide concrete examples of how our species remains very much a part of this fabric. But until we're able to find ways to connect our daily lives to nature and to make sure that um, children like Sarah no longer fall into the trap of the disconnect that can occur between uh, the value of nature to our own well-being, uh, we'll have a very hard time finding the motivation to do what's necessary to both preserve the diversity of life in which that which we've have inherited, which at the same time is really uh, protecting our own well-being. And with that, I will conclude and take questions. Mm.
so that's a great question, which is what, what can we do in grammar schools to make these issues relevant to kids in grammar schools? And um, I think I'll start by saying that what I see mostly, and this isn't so much in grammar schools, it's slightly older, but I, I, I do think it's an issue that we need to address head on even at the grammar school level, is that you know, as you've seen in my remarks, these problems are not small, and in many ways, we're making great headway, particularly in the realm of habitat loss, uh, to do something about biodiversity loss. We're not making such great way on climate change. But to present a big problem, which has immediate relevance to our well-being and very significant relevance, uh, but not propose solutions, uh, is essentially scaring the dickens out of our kids uh, without really doing what I would hope, which is it say uh, something slightly different, which is, uh, boy, these are big problems and they're really important, but we want to inspire you to help us solve them. And I think, you know, it's interesting, uh, especially in kids in the grammar school uh, age, I think there's a tremendous amount to be said for giving them opportunities to make a bond with the natural world so that they understand that nature exists and that it's relevant. Uh, I had a conversation with E.O. Wilson many years ago now. Uh, he was particularly interested in the fact that I was a pediatrician. And uh, he told me that, that he believes that there may be um, what I would describe as a sensitive period in development for forming a bond with nature, which is to say that if a human being doesn't understand early in life that nature is important to human welfare, it's very difficult to teach that to someone in a college classroom. And so in the grammar school setting, I think that uh, uh, is, it, and that's one reason why I'm a big proponent, for example, of schoolyard gardens. I think that's an incredibly powerful way of people recognizing, okay, uh, these are living things. Uh, I understand that this is food. And you know what? Sometimes things don't work out the way they're supposed to or unexpected things happen. Uh, pathogens enter the garden. Um, I had a friend, uh, this is in D.C., uh, works in a schoolyard gardens program. They planted peanuts and squirrels ate all the peanuts in the third grade classroom. And so uh, what was interesting to her is that the students didn't really panic or say how horrible. They said, wow, we've got three peanuts left, which was kind of interesting. But they immediately understood that you know, producing food is not exactly completely controllable. And that's a pretty amazing lesson, which I think gives people or gives those children the framework to say uh, nature is both extremely important and relevant and needs to be thought of as so. And that's the kind of uh, curriculum that I would advocate for. It's, it's the kind that introduces the idea that uh, nature is important, that uh, it is not entirely within our control, and that uh, it's important to be, to be fascinated by it in some way. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, that's a great question. And the question is, are there losses or reductions in biodiversity today that we're not going to be able to pick up for another generation? And so one way to try and answer that question is to look at the past and see if we can sort of trace current problems related to biodiversity loss that may have started a long time ago. Um, so one example that I uh, didn't have time to talk about but I can present now speaks to that question. So uh, many uh, of the viewers uh, will be familiar with the fact that many uh, fisheries in the oceans, places where we catch fish for human consumption, have been uh, over-harvested so that the rate of catch is outpacing the rate at which the fish can reproduce, uh, such that about a third, uh, as many as a third of these fisheries have collapsed so that they're no longer viable, and another chunk uh, are overfished and headed that way. Uh, this is a fact that catches many people by surprise in an era in which we go to the grocery store and we perhaps have more fish available to us than ever. Um, uh, what's interesting is that if you remember what the fish were in your 
uh, fishmongers counter 20 years ago, they were quite different. So for example, uh, you used to be able to get red snapper. Not so easy to get red snapper anymore. You used to get a lot of Chilean sea bass. Can't get a lot of Chilean sea bass. Bluefin tuna. So there's been a whole series of fish that we've overfished. Um, now, that process started in the 1950s, so that uh, the uh, industrialization of fishing led to bigger and bigger boats which could catch more and more fish, and there was an enormous demand for it. And the acceleration of fish harvest out of the oceans occurred over a period of perhaps 20 to 30 years, between the late 1950s and the mid-1980s. Um, it turns out that about a billion people today are subsistence fishermen, meaning that their primary source of protein comes from seafood. And these are people largely living in Southeast Asia and in Western Equatorial Africa, although many other parts. And you can imagine that if uh, you were a traditional subsistence fisherman, for example, in Western Equatorial Africa, and you started fishing and realizing that there were no fish left in the ocean, you would still want to eat protein. And in that part of the world, uh, one of the alternative sources of protein has always been going into the jungle and eating whatever animal you could find. Uh, it turns out that uh, one of the species that's uh, consumed, uh, one group of the species, are non-human primates. And uh, we know that uh, HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus, uh, was transmitted into humans through the consumption of so-called bushmeat uh, many, many years ago, and on many occasions. But what's interesting is that there's now research that shows that in some parts of Western Equatorial Africa, the depletion of fish, which has occurred over a 30-year time frame, has gotten so severe that people are actually turning more to eating bushmeat as a protein source, and that we continue to see transmission of viruses like HIV into human populations. And again, this is an example of us pulling on these strings of the tapestry of life without really knowing what's going to fall off or how the tapestry is going to be changed. But had you asked an infectious disease expert 20 years ago if overfishing in the Atlantic might lead to the emergence of a new pathogen like HIV, they would have probably justifiably said, that's ridiculous. But in fact, that may be very well what's happening. And so uh, we really, it's a shocking recognition that we really understand extraordinarily little about biodiversity even today. I mentioned we have put names to two million species, most of those only from a single encounter. Uh, there may be 10 million species alone that does not include microbial species. So you can imagine that if we barely know the names of the species, how can we really understand the ecosystems in which they partake of? And yet we know that these ecosystems are critically important, as I mentioned in my remarks, to the spread of infectious diseases or, as I didn't talk about, the production of our food, um, and so forth and so on. But yes, absolutely, I think there's reason to believe that not only do we not have the best pulse on species extinction rates today, because we are losing species before we even know they exist, um, but that it would be foolish to expect that the results of this loss would be simultaneous. And that's a very difficult thing to motivate people, because people will say, well, if you're telling me we're losing species 100 times faster than we did in the pre-human era, I think, you know, I look outside, uh, the birds are chirping, the trees are blooming, the flowers are out. Uh, what could possibly be wrong with nature? And so I think it's really important that we present these concrete examples so that people really can see that these disruptions to ecology have profound effects upon our health today. And that many of them have roots from 30 years ago. But that it's also very clear that if we continue to act in the ways we have always acted, we may not be able to predict what the outcomes were, but in many cases, uh, there's no reason to believe it's going to be beneficial, <laughs> um, with a few exceptions. Please. Uh, I have a question that's outside the particular expertise, but that's maybe your experience. Um, that's another great question, which, which, which asks, what is it that people can do to make clear the relevance of, in this case, dealing with carbon emissions, the, the major source of climate change? And uh, it turns out that um, as a doctor, um, I'm in the business of trying to get people to do what they would not otherwise do. <laughs> um, be it take a medicine or exercise more, you, you know all the things, right? So uh, one of the wonderful 
uh, things that I get out of being both a doctor and involved in these problems is my experience as a physician teaches me, in fact, a lot about how to address the question um, that you pose. So it's very clear, and you know, as I, I joked about with Sarah, saying that you know, one thing I learned is to praise a mother whenever you have the chance. It's also very clear if you want to make sure that people don't do what you want them to, is to sort of tell them what to do. No one likes being told what to do. And for many of the people who are doubtful about the role of carbon dioxide and its contribution to climate change, uh, if they haven't acknowledged that as a cause, it's very difficult for them to say, well, you should change your behavior for something you don't believe in. Um, but what, what's in, so there's a couple things I would say. One is that it turns out that carbon emissions are related to energy use and pretty much everybody likes to save money. So in many venues, and this stems from everything now to building design standards, to uh, farmers who are putting windmills on their land not because it reduces carbon emissions but because they get paid to do it, we're realizing that energy efficiency and alternative energy make money. So you think, think about ways for common denominators. So in what way can you connect the values of the person you're talking with that may not have anything to do with climate change but may have to do with saving money or uh, making money? That's one thing. Look for the common, uh, the common values. But the other thing, and this is another part of my work that I think is relevant, is that uh, it turns out that really everyone cares about their own health and they definitely care about the health of their children. And when it comes to climate change, even when people are doubtful about whether climate change is happening or what's driving it, when their children understand that climate change is caused by carbon dioxide, as they increasingly do, and that's one of the things you'll recognize if you go into any public school in the country, is that children generally get this. Um, and they go to their parents and say, I'm sorry, I don't understand why you're doing this, this is my planet too, and I understand that this is quite damaging. Uh, that uh, it is in fact people who are not out of college, who have the greatest influence, I think, for the potential positive here. Not only because of their influence upon the people who are calling shots, um, but also because it turns out that I believe that one of the things that limits our ability to innovate, and we desperately need innovation, particularly with our fuels, is that for those of us who have become successful, and by successful I mean uh, we have the, the ability to control our environment, we have, you know, we're the ones setting policies, we're the ones making decisions that affect lots of people. For those people in those positions, they have gotten to those positions in life in a model that relies exclusively, largely, on fossil fuels. And if you live that existence, you in fact get blinders about what else might be possible. And there are lots of examples of how younger generations today have really forced upon older generations new paradigms. And the best example I have is Google. Um, so when I was in college, there was a, a guy uh, who was not in college, he was a grad student, but he was on campus at the same time, who looked at the original search engine, which was Yahoo. And uh, Yahoo uh, originally made the web into categories. So in order to find what you wanted, you had to click on a category. So you wanted to find something about the Boston Bruins, you had to click on sports, hockey, professionals, NHL, Bruins. And he looked at this and he says, no one wants to look at the world through somebody else's eyes. I want to look at the world through my eyes. Why can't we design something where somebody just types in Bruins and it gives them what they want? Well, prior to Google, that was impossible because everything before that, be it a telephone book, the encyclopedia, you named it, had to be pre-digested so that you could get access to the information. Anyway, it's the absence of the blinders that I think is helpful. And if you're going to think about people to work with, uh, helping children understand these issues I think is very important.